Welcome again to Grand Rounds. Um, today's presentation is part of our quality care series and we're delighted to have Dr. Brian Brennan speak to us about appropriate use of medications for anxiety disorders. This follows on Dr. Unger's presentation on appropriate um, use of medications in psychotic disorders. And so there's a hospital-wide initiative um, really ongoing to try to be more judicious and diligent about appropriate use and maybe some inappropriate uses and trying to minimize those inappropriate uses because all medications have side effects and costs and all sorts of other um, challenges and problems that come with them. So for those of you who don't know Dr. Brennan, he is an assistant professor of psychiatry here at Harvard Medical School and medical director of the Obsessive Compulsive Disorders Institute here at McLean Hospital. He also serves as associate director of the translational neuroscience research in the biological psychiatry laboratory here at McLean. His research focuses on the use of neuroimaging as a means to better understand the mechanism of action of both standard and novel treatments for mood and anxiety disorders, and to identify neurochemical and functional mediators of treatment response. His clinical and research work has led to grant funding from the National Institute of Mental Health, NARSAD, the Sidney Bear Junior Foundation, and the Stanley Medical Research Institute, and also to his receipt of the Outstanding Professional of the Year Award from the Boston Chapter of the, of the Depression and Bipolar Disorder Support Alliance. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Brennan. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Uh, so I'm tasked today with talking about appropriate uses of medication to treat anxiety, a topic that might seem straightforward, but as I realized in putting this talk together is anything but. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to clarify that even just a little bit today. My very short list of disclosures. So just a general outline of what I hope to talk about today. Um, first, just to give a general outline about anxiety. So um, anxiety is a multifaceted sort of thing. You can see it in, in all sorts of different contexts, which I think in, in, in many ways makes it so difficult to treat. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about DSM-5 now uh, and how they've categorized anxiety and anxiety disorders per se. Also uh, diagnosis and then the epidemiology of anxiety disorders. And then I'll jump right into providing some of the background and evidence uh, for first-line pharmacologic treatments for, for anxiety, as well as what, what I would consider uh, second and third line treatments, and some of the evidence or lack thereof, uh, which is important here, um, for uh, these medication treatments for anxiety. And then talk a little bit about unique clinical scenarios. So again, I think this is an important thing to highlight in this talk, is that anxiety rarely exists in a vacuum. This is something that is frequently comorbid with a variety of different psychiatric disorders, which makes it very difficult to treat. So I want to talk a, a, about a few of those situations um, and how we could think about them and, and, and approach them from a pharmacologic perspective. And then lastly, what to do when medications don't work. This is something we all, um, as clinicians, probably have run into at one point or another. Um, with our patients and how do we think about this and what, what can we do when this situa situation arises. And then um, I purposefully w wanted to leave some time at the end for questions and discussion because we've got lots of clinicians with very rich uh, clinical experience out here dealing with very specific patient populations as well and I want to tap into that and maybe make this really more of a forum like it was originally designed to be. So first off, what, what is anxiety? Um, I want to highlight uh, this review paper by Peter Roy Byrne, who is a psychiatrist uh, out at the University of Washington and is an anxiety and mood disorders expert. And this is a great paper if any of you want to, want to read a little bit more about this. But I've taken a lot of these uh, bullet points from his paper. And he talks about an interesting thing. You can see anxiety in so many, so many different ways um, in the context of a variety of different things. I mean. It, at its very basic, it's a distressing subjective experience that, that we all have it's at one point or another. Um, we experience it, I experienced it uh, 15 minutes before coming here to give this talk. Um, for, for many of us, uh, it happens, we get past it, it, we put it behind us and we move on, it doesn't impact our lives in any real significant way. 
Beyond that, um, anxiety can be a symptom that can be reported to, to healthcare practitioners, psychiatrists, therapists, but, but general practitioners, medical doctors, in the context of all sorts of different disorders, including medical conditions. Um, take that one step further, and it becomes a very specific hallmark symptom of a, of a very specific category of disorders, what we call anxiety disorders, which I'll talk about more. More recently, I think DSM-5 realized that anxiety is, is a component of all sorts of different psychiatric disorders, not just anxiety disorders, and for that reason, they have now included it as a qualifier in DSM-5, particularly a qualifier for depression and bipolar disorder which had never really been done before, amazingly. I mean, we, we think about anxiety as being uh, a component of all sorts of disorders that we treat, but it, it had not been specifically included as a symptom qualifier until just recently. And then, as I'll talk about as we go along, anxiety is a component of all sorts of different disorders, uh, not just anxiety disorders, but autism spectrum disorders, bipolar disorder, which I'll talk about a lot today substance use disorders as well, and, and importantly, not just during intoxication and withdrawal, but also outside of those periods as well. And then ADHD, which I won't touch on too much today, but certainly there's a, a lot of overlap um, with, with ADHD as well. I think on the topic of ADHD, it reminds me that I should probably mention that this talk is really primarily going to be focused on adults. I, I don't present any any information here that's specifically uh, targeting the pediatric population, which, as you can imagine, could be a lecture in and of itself. So uh, the very basic definition of anxiety, so this is how Webster describes it. Uh, again, apprehensive uneasiness or nervousness usually over an impending or anticipated ill. We're all familiar with this. And again, this is usually something that we all get by and it doesn't really impact us very much and we move on with our lives. There are those that can't get past this, that experience this in a persistent way with a variety of different things throughout their day to the point where it becomes overwhelming and impacts them in, in significant ways. And this, this is one of the best sort of depictions, I think, of what really is sort of classic generalized anxiety. Um, and as you can see, I mean, this, this, this person talks about all sorts of different things, sleep difficulties, worrying, um, being unable to control the worry, even though he understands that it's you know, probably excessive, um, and even autonomic symptoms, um, um, increases in heart rate when uh, in the face of fear or anxiety. Now, you would think, looking at this, this is clearly somebody who has an extensive working knowledge of, of DSM-5. And um, he may, um, but uh, many of you might be familiar with this. Frighteningly, this is like 30 some years old at this point. Um, and so for, for those of you in the room who don't know what this is from, this is, this is Colin Hay um, of the 80s band Men at Work. Um, so this is the song Overkill, which probably many of us have heard lots and lots. I, I admit that I, I've known this song almost my entire life, um, and never really listened to the lyrics until fairly recently and realized, hey, this guy is talking about GAD. <laughs> um, but it really is a pretty good description of, of generalized anxiety. So talking about anxiety disorders specifically, um, not just in, including anxiety, but they, they in, include fear. So they really, in DSM-5, they parse it into fear and anxiety, fear being an emotional response to a perceived threat. It's really the autonomic arousal, the flight or fight or flight response that, that we experience with these things. And then the anxiety is more the sort of anticipatory uh, experience, the, the muscle tension, disruptions in sleep, and, and oftentimes avoidance of things that are going to cause us to feel fear. And the key things in DSM-5 that separate anxiety disorders out from, you know, just general run-of-the-mill anxiety that we all experience are three really important things. One is that, that these things are excessive or out of proportion to the actual threat posed. Two, they persist. So, that, you know, it's not like we experience these things in the context of, a, of an anxiety-inducing experience and they go away. These people have anxiety all the time and it persists for months and months. And uh, it's debilitating. So it, it causes significant distress, gets in the way of us being able to live our lives in, in a meaningful and, and full way. 
So talk a little bit, just again, briefly about epidemiology and background. It's some, there's some amazing data points here. One is how, how prevalent these things are. So it's anxiety disorders, and, and by this, I'll get, to, I'll get to this in a second, but by anxiety disorders, primarily here I'm talking about generalized anxiety, social anxiety, and panic disorder. Some of the figures here are probably quoting PTSD and OCD as well, which were up until up until DSM-5 came out, were also included as anxiety disorders. But still, if you if you look at these numbers, um, anxiety disorders are the most common class of mental disorders affecting nearly one in three adults at some point in their life. That's a pretty astounding number. They do occur more frequently in women than in men, approximately two to one. And it's pretty astounding how highly comorbid these disorders are with other psychiatric disorders. So. Uh, over half of patients that have one anxiety disorder frequently have many. Um, over half of patients with depression have an anxiety disorder. Over half of patients with bipolar disorder have an anxiety disorder. And nearly half of patients with ADHD. So it gets back to what I was saying before, is that you, know, you, you will find anxiety disorder as a single entity, but most of the time it's uh, co-occurring with a variety of other psychiatric disorders, which obviously makes it just that much more complicated to treat. So this is how DSM-5 now categorizes anxiety disorders. The, the key point here, like I said, is that up until DSM-5, uh, both PTSD and OCD have been included in this category. They have now, um, I think rightfully so, have been moved to their own separate categories. The three disorders that I'm going to sort of focus on primarily today are the ones in red, so generalized anxiety, social anxiety, and uh, panic disorder. It's worth mentioning, um, you know, going down the list here, that. Substance and medication-induced anxiety disorder is not something we necessarily think about a lot, but probably happens much more than we actually realize. And in particular, with a couple of these things that I've listed here, like caffeine, for example, which may not be a single inducer of an anxiety disorder, but certainly uh, can exacerbate things in people who have underlying anxiety already. Uh, so I just presented the DSM-5 criteria here. Most of you. Uh, folks are familiar with these things, so I'm not going to go through it in too much detail. Uh, with generalized anxiety, it's really, as we already talked about, excessive worry that's difficult to control. It's associated with a number of uh, physical symptoms and causes significant distress or impairment, and importantly, is not caused by a substance or a medical condition. Social anxiety is similar, although really primarily focused on uh, social or performance situations um, when being around unfamiliar people. And then panic disorder, um, so these are recurrent. Keyword here is unexpected, so we don't necessarily think about this a lot, but tried and true panic disorders really are things that tend to come out of the blue. You know, they, they're, they're not necessarily associated with a clear identifiable trigger a lot. Uh, the other th key thing here is that uh, once people with panic disorder have one of these things, they worry about it all the time happening again. In fact, avoid situations where they think it might happen. Um, and then there's a, a variety of different sorts of physical symptoms that can come along with a panic disorder that are definitive for panic, panic attacks. And again, not related to substance use, withdrawal, medical condition. So to jump right in here to first line treatments, and again, this really applies to, to these three disorders uh, together. Um, the data out there really pretty firmly uh, identifies the serotonergic antidepressants, primarily SSRIs uh, and the dual action agents like venlafaxine and duloxetine as the primary medication treatments for, for anxiety disorders. I list here, you know, do not use benzodiazepines. Um, you know, the general guideline here is, is if avoidable, better not to. Uh, there are obviously situations where you might need to use a benzodiazepine. So as, as many of us here know, it, it, you know, SSRIs and SNRIs don't work overnight. These things t tend to take weeks, if not many weeks, to actually have their full effect. And so if you have somebody who clearly is, is extremely incapacitated, um, there's a high acuity where you really need rapid reduction in anxiety symptoms quickly, this would be in the context of suicidality, risk of self-harm. Um, clearly, use of a benzodiazepine is, is, is worth doing. But these, you know, benzodiazepines have risks. Um, and the general guideline here is that if, if we can use them as, as, as short-term treatments, all the better. 
um, really until the SSRI or SNRI can really kick in and have its effect. If, the, if there's not that acuity there, then in all honesty, some would argue better to stay away from them. And in fact, there's some evidence that suggests that the addition of a benzo really doesn't improve outcome in anxiety disorders over an SSRI alone. Um, the other interesting point here is that you could, you could imagine that starting somebody on a benzodiazepine concurrently with an SSRI to treat anxiety and the person experiences rapid benefit with the benzodiazepine overnight and says, this is great. Why am I even taking this other medication? I'll just take the benzodiazepine. You know, that, that does happen. Um, so so there, is, there is some risk of problems with treatment adherence with, with a serotonergic antidepressant if, if you start it concurrently with a benzodiazepine. And then importantly, and this is going to be a, 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 a running point throughout this entire talk, is that psychotherapeutic uh, options should be considered all the time for these anxiety disorders, particularly CBT. Um, this is obviously a medication talk, uh, so I'm not focusing on that, but I want to reiterate this over and over, and I, and I will. It's in many slides. Uh, this is really just to make you aware that there actually aren't a lot of FDA-approved treatments for anxiety disorders. A few of the SSRIs have uh, sparse indications for these things, uh, but it's not like we're looking at a huge uh, long list of FDA approved treatments that are out there. Um, that being said, you know, all of the, essentially all of the SSRIs uh, get used for anxiety, whether they're indicated or not, FDA indica uh, approved or not. The, the other uh, medication on here, Buspar or Buspirone, um, has, an, has an FDA approval for quote unquote anxiety, which is, you know, really translates to GAD. And we'll, we'll talk about, I'll talk about this more, but um, I think many of us in the room who have used buspirone um, or have uh, had seen patients who have been prescribed buspirone uh, realize that the, that the reality in clinical practice is not what we once thought it was when it first came on the market. It's not nearly as effective as it was thought to be or hoped to be when, when it first came out, so it really doesn't get used all that much anymore. So um, second and third line treatments, not nearly as straightforward as first line treatments. And so uh, for that reason, I'm going to go through, through this for each of the three anxiety disorders specifically. Uh, but one of the key points here is that, so similar to depression, where you find a, a really amazingly large population of patients who do not respond to primary uh, medication treatments for depression. The same is there for anxiety. Really, roughly about half of people uh, with an anxiety disorder who go on an SSRI or an SNRI don't get, don't get a full response. Um, many of these people get a partial response, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a second, too. So there have been a whole host, just, so just like depression, there have been a whole host of medications that have been looked at as uh, alternative, and these are all, um, I highlight in red here, off-label uses of these things. So um, anything from the tricyclic antidepressants to obviously benzodiazepines and, and buspirone, as I just talked about, a whole host of different anticonvulsant medications, and then uh, the newer atypical antipsychotics, primarily quetiapine, risperidone, and olanzapine. So I'm going to go through some of the data for uh, each of the three anxiety disorders with, with these treatments. So for GAD, um, second-line treatment. So benzodiazepines pretty much across the board um, are considered second-line treatments. Again, first line, if you've got somebody who's really acute and you need rapid reduction in anxiety. Beyond that, I would probably put them in the second-line treatment category. They obviously have really good evidence, and clinically they work. Um, but they have... They have uh, some downsides. Primarily, it's abuse, liability, and dependence, and the potential for withdrawal when coming off them. Um, so they really are things that, if can be used in the short term, all the better. The, I think the, the really interesting, when I was putting this talk together, the, the interesting thing that came across to me was the amount of data that's actually out there for pregabalin or Lyrica in the treatment of anxiety disorders. So, this, uh, to give some of you some background on, on Lyrica, uh, this is a medication that was first developed as an anticonvulsant uh, 
and now has FDA approval uh, not just to treat uh, certain types of seizures, but also to treat peripheral neuropathy and fibromyalgia, so chronic pain syndromes. Interestingly enough, it actually has approval in, in the European Union to treat generalized anxiety disorder, but it does not here in the U.S. Um, so as you can imagine, there's, a, there's actually a, a, a significant amount of data. So I list some of it here, um, multiple randomized controlled trials showing it to be more effective than placebo and as effective as benzodiazepines in the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder. So um, it really is squarely in the second line treatment category. If you, if you look at the European treatment guidelines, it's actually a first line treatment. Um, and it's pretty amazing. I, mean, I, I knew there was some data out there on this, but I didn't actually know it was this significant. And I, my, my sense is that we don't really use it all that much in clinical practice for this, for this reason. Um, but, but there is some argument that it might actually be worth considering. The, the, the main downsides to, um, to Lyrica primarily are sedation and, and dizziness. There is some suggestion of weight gain as well. Um, in my limited clinical experience with it, um, the sedation is actually pretty, pretty profound. So I've had a couple people who really just couldn't tolerate it because of sedation. The literature that's out there actually suggests that maybe I just had some atypical experiences and that people otherwise tolerate it pretty well. Um, but it is something to, to, to keep on the list um, of things if, if you need to go down to the second tier of, of, of treatments. There's pretty good data out there for the tricyclic antidepressants, particularly with the mipramine. Um, but, you know, as we all know, these, the, the tricyclics are a little bit limited by, prominently by, by anticholinergic effects. And obviously, with somebody who has any concern of suicidality, you would worry about um, overdose. But they are things to think about. Third line treatments. Um, so uh, the atypical antipsychotic uh, quetiapine, um, or also known as Seroquel, uh, there is certainly some data uh, to support Seroquel, and it, 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 it could be thought of as a second-line treatment. I've listed it as a third-line treatment for a number of reasons. One, the data is fairly limited, uh, but even more so, you know, uh, quetiapine, along with the other atypical antipsychotics, is really limited by tolerability and by long-term safety profile. So these are medications that are, that are some frequently hard for people to take, particularly quetiapine, which is pretty sedating, um, but even more so the long-term safety concerns, primarily with metabolic side effects and weight gain, um, alterations in lipid profile and cholesterol, prediabetes syndromes, things like this, which clearly are, are not good. And um, in, in my, my own take on this is that you, you, you have to have pretty good, pretty good darn reason to give somebody this medication and good evidence to support it. Um, there are situations where you might think about an atypical antipsychotic, and I'm going to get to that in a second, um, when you're considering certain types of comorbidities. Um, but to treat simple standalone generalized anxiety with an atypical, I really would go through a number of these other things that I've just mentioned before getting to that point. I've included buspirone as a third-line treatment only because, as I said, it's you know, limited effectiveness in clinical practice. Um, gabapentin which, um, similar to pregabalin, is an anticonvulsant uh, that's also used for, for chronic pain disorders. There's really limited data. We use it a lot, uh, mainly because it's fairly benign and there aren't a whole lot of side effects associated with it. But there's not a whole lot of data out there to support it. So uh, I really would put it down here in this third-line treatment category. Um, same for uh, um, Hydroxyzine, um, which is uh, Vistro, another, uh, the uh, brand name is Vistro, uh, which is basically an antihistamine. So again, fair, fairly safe, but just not a whole lot of data. Uh, this is a list of things that I, that really don't have enough data for me to really firmly recommend them. So other other atypicals outside of quetiapine and really limited data. And again, with, with the safety issues and tolerability issues, just not things that I would, that I would recommend. Again, there are exceptions to this based on, bi uh, on, on comorbidity, particularly bipolar disorder patients. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. 
Other anticonvulsants other than pregabalin or gabapentin, I wouldn't suggest. This is not just not a whole lot of data again. Um, and beta blockers, which do get used really primarily for uh, performance anxiety, public speaking anxiety, things like that, um, but not a whole lot of evidence for, for generalized anxiety or, or honestly other anxiety disorders. Uh, social anxiety. So this is a, uh, actually a condensed list compared to, to GAD. The second line treatments are actually relatively similar, um, certainly benzodiazepines. And pregabalin, there's some data, but not nearly as much as with uh, generalized anxiety. And similar to generalized anxiety, gabapentin has some data, but really not a whole lot. Uh, and I would not really recommend any of the atypicals, um, even less data here in social anxiety than in generalized anxiety. Um, and buspirone and beta blockers really with no, with no data at all. And then lastly, panic disorder. So uh, really pretty good evidence for the tricyclics here, uh, both clomipramine and amipramine, and then obviously benzodiazepines, particularly uh, the longer acting uh, benzodiazepines like clonazepam, which can be used as good prophylactic treatment. So this, this would be a situation where you know, one could make an argument that long-term treatment with a benzodiazepine is actually worthwhile. Um, the other uh, medication I've listed here as a second-line treatment is mirtazapine or Remeron, which has um, some data, not, not a lot, but some to at least include it in this category. And then I've, I've included the third line, uh, the atypicals as third-line treatments here. Um, all of them have limited data, but again, I, I personally would reserve these things for the most severe refractory cases, again, because of the side effect profile and long-term safety issues. And again, things that are not recommended, so again, buspirone, various types of anticonvulsants, so pregabalin or gabapentin really have not been studied and not, have not been shown to have benefit in, in panic disorder and beta blockers as well. So one question that, that after all that, uh, one question that comes up is, so, you know, these second and third line treatments, well, how, how do you use them? Do you use them as monotherapy? Do you use them as augmentation treatments? Do you add them to an SSRI or an SNRI if uh, people get some degree of partial response to those things? And the short answer is, this is not a question that's really been definitively answered. Um, in fact, there's only one decent um, study that's out there that's looked at this, and that was a, a fairly recent meta-analysis that looked at basically all of the trials out there that had been done with various types of treatments um, that were not SSRIs or SNRIs and anxiety disorders. And they set very strict criteria. What they wanted to see were that these trials were uh, placebo-controlled trials, that they were really done in a way that was examining specifically augmentation. So they would enroll people, give, put them on an SSRI or an SNRI for eight weeks. They'd uh, see who responded, who didn't respond. The, the people who didn't respond, they would continue in the study, and they would augment them with a medication or a placebo. So really, you know, this is the gold standard design. Amazingly, there are only six trials that have been done that fit that criteria. Um, and if you pull these things together on a meta-analysis, you get about 550 participants. Um, three of the studies were in generalized anxiety, one in social anxiety, and two in panic. And they used either antipsychotics, uh, two used clonazepam, and one used pregabalin. And so this is a forest plot showing what they found. And, and the take-home point here is that they did find some evidence that augmentation with any of these agents so it was mainly quetiapine, clonazepam, uh, or pregabalin were the three compounds that they primarily looked at. There was a modest reduction in symptom severity with augmentation. So again, these things added to an SSRI or an SNRI. Um, the even bigger take home point here is that we, there's just not a lot of data out there to really guide clinicians on what to do. Uh, and what, what's really needed is um, an algorithm-based longitudinal study. So there's something like the STAR-D study that was done in depression. So for those who aren't familiar with STAR-D, this was a study that involved many different centers um, and enrolled participants 
in a design similar to what I just described. So they would start people on an SSRI as the first phase. They'd take them through that phase. If they didn't respond to an SSRI, they might switch them to another agent, oftentimes a different SSRI or an SNRI. They would take them through that phase. If they didn't finish with that, then they would augment it with Wellbutrin or with a, a different medication, then they would take them to the next phase. So it's an algorithm based really to looking at how to treat treatment resistant depression. Um, that's really what we need here in anxiety. A lot of people have pushed for that, but it hasn't happened. So um, I did want to include a slide talking about uh, atypical antipsychotic prescribing for anxiety disorders because I think this is it's an important topic um, because I think it's become it's becoming a growing problem. I mean, there are certainly instances where antipsychotics do need to get used, um, but I think they're probably overused. And, and you know, so this study was done at now over five years ago, and what they did was actually this was a, a survey that was given to office-based uh, psychiatric practices to evaluate their antipsychotic prescribing for people with primary anxiety disorders. And this, this was actually, um, the survey was carried out over a 10-year period between uh, 1996 and 2007, so already 10 years out um, from this. But what it showed is that, so in, in the top uh, graph there, basically shows that over this 10-year period, there is essentially a two-fold increase in the rate of, uh, of antipsychotic prescribing for anxiety disorders in, in office-based, primarily outpatient practices. Um, and the proportion of visits for anxiety disorders in which an antipsychotic medication was prescribed increased from one in, five, one in 10 to one in five. The bottom graph actually breaks this down a little bit because you might say, well, what about, what about the older antipsychotics, the typical antipsychotics? That, you, know, you know, are people prescribing those more? And the answer is, short answer is no. Um, in fact, the red line in the, in the bottom graph there are the, are the older typical antipsychotics and the, the rate of prescribing is actually going down a bit. Um, so this is wholly uh, a result of an increase in the second generation antipsychotic prescribing for anxiety disorders. And again, this was um, over a 10-year period that ended about 10 years ago. So what's the data from the last 10 years? My, my guess would be that this is continuing to go up. Um, it, interestingly enough, the, these are also patients that are out, you know, out there in outpatient practice. Um, they're not the folks we're actually seeing here in McLean, which an argument could be made that we need to do this more in McLean because we just, we've got, unfortunately, sicker people. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't think they looked at that in a, in a very, yes, yeah, in a very detailed way. I think that's great. That's a great question. Um, one would hope that there are people who have failed the typical approaches. Yeah, yeah. So um, as I said in, at the beginning here, that the challenge oftentimes is, is the comorbidity that comes along with anxiety disorders. Um, this is a pretty astounding number. I mean, 60 to 80 percent of patients with an anxiety disorder have at least one other comorbid like So it's, it's, it's the norm. To, to have something else besides just an anxiety disorder. Rarely do we see somebody who just walks in our office with, with generalized anxiety disorder. And the presence of a comorbid disorder is associated with all sorts of badness. Um, more severe symptoms, poorer outcomes, greater impairment, poorer quality of life, increased risk of suicide. I mean, uh, the, the, these are unfortunately the folks that we, that we see here um, for the most part. So, one comorbid illness that I think is worthy of really focusing on here is bipolar disorder and anxiety. So, it was as I went through some of this uh, literature, I was I was actually amazed with some of the things that I was finding as well. And you know, the, the, some of the numbers as far as prevalence of an anxiety disorder along with bipolar disorder are pretty astounding. I mean, they, they quote them all the way up to seventy five percent, which is pretty amazing. Um, for me, it was also the realization that <clears throat> it's not just comorbidity. I mean, I think there's, there's overlap here. Uh, I think there's biological overlap. And, th and some of the, the reason I say that is, is some of these other points that I highlight on this slide. So um, in, in people who uh, have bipolar disorder and an anxiety disorder, it's frequently the anxiety disorder that predates the bipolar illness. So on average, three years before 
And interestingly, um, the presence of an anxiety disorder oftentimes predicts the transition from somebody who's been diagnosed as unipolar uh, to bipolar disorder. So this, this comes from a study that Roy Perlis um, and colleagues at MGH did. And, and what they did was basically look at survey data from about 6,000 or so patients with unipolar depression and follow them out over a period of about three years uh, with an interest in looking at what factors uh, predict people um, essentially moving on from bipolar, from unipolar depression to bipolar disorder? You know, who predicts, what predicts somebody having some sort of a manic switch or, you know, uh, um, dysphoric episode or any of these things? And interestingly, one of the strongest predictors was the presence of any of the three anxiety disorders that I'm talking about today. So panic, social anxiety, or generalized anxiety. If you, if, you, if you had any of those things, your risk of transitioning from unipolar to bipolar disorder was significantly higher. Just, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, and the next point here, dysphoria or mixed states in the context of bipolar disorder commonly misdiagnosed as anxiety. Um, you know, I think we, we see this a fair amount. You know, we see somebody maybe who's been um, diagnosed as unipolar and treat them with an antidepressant and you know, um, the after effects of that are basically what I talk about in the bottom point here, which, you know, children of bipolar parents treated for anxiety oftentimes have higher rates of agitation and irritability, really things that are indicative of manic switch. Um, so again, it really sort of highlights the fact that there's probably some, some biological overlap here, and it's not a surprise that we see such a high number of bipolar disorder patients who have anxiety symptoms. So what do we do? Um, you know, Obviously, treating someone with bipolar disorder with an SSRI or an SNRI carries a whole lot of risk um, as far as precipitating mania and, and worsening their affective liability. So what, what types of approaches make sense? Well, this may be a no-brainer, no but ensuring adequate mood stabilization is the first, the first thing. I mean, it may be that getting them uh, more adequately treated on a mood stabilizer may improve anxiety symptoms, especially if they're in the context of some underlying uh, dysphoric state or mixed state. Um, as I said, avoiding antidepressants, particularly in, in type 1 bipolar disorder, is, is important. Um, or if they, if they need to be used, used cautiously with good concomitant mood stabilization. Um, I, caution here with any benzodiazepine use, particularly uh, in those with history of substance abuse, just because there's, as we all know, there's a fair, fairly high comorbidity with substance use disorders in the bipolar population. Um, and here is really a, a, a place where atypical antipsychotics psychotics do sometimes make sense. Uh, so considering medications that are effective for both disorders. So, this would be a place where you might think about an atypical um, to treat anxiety symptoms uh, because, you know, as, as, we, as many of us know, the, the atypicals are, have FD, actually FDA approval for bipolar maintenance, bipolar depression, and bipolar mania. And there is actually some limited support for this with quetiapine, olanzapine, and lorazidone. So this, this is one of those situations where an atypical may, may make sense. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, and um, you'll see this a couple times as we go on here, um, psychotherapeutic options, CBT, no risk of manic switch, you know, no side effects. This, this is, you got to be thinking about CBT uh, when, you, when you see folks like this. Uh, another situation where um, comorbidity plays a role and makes, makes treatment much more challenging is, is the comorbidity between substance use disorders and anxiety disorders. So nearly 18% of patients with, with current substance use disorders also meet criteria for an anxiety disorder. Again, the anxiety disorders frequently precede the comorbid alcohol or drug use disorders. And there's a debate in the field, I think, with this, whether what's the chicken and what's the egg here? Um, is self-medication of an anxiety disorder leading to substance abuse? or you've, the flip of that is chronic substance abuse and withdrawal leading to anxiety symptoms. And I think this has been a topic that's been bandied about in, in the substance abuse community with no real definitive answer. It could be, it could be both. The key points, I think, here, a couple of things. Um, it's really difficult to assess anxiety disorders in the setting of substance abuse. And it, it, 
it really needs to be delayed until any kind of intoxication or withdrawal syndrome is behind you. Um, for some medications, particularly long-acting benzodiazepines like clonazepam or diazepam, um, things like long-acting long opiates like methadone or, can or cannabis, um, this could be weeks. Um, you, you really can't fully assess this. In addition to the standards for alcohol and illicit drugs that we think about, it's important always in these, in these populations to be thinking about other sorts of substances that people could be taking, like over-the-counter substances. Um, caffeine and diet pills are, are two big things that I put here, but there are various other things as well. And anxiety symptoms must be present during times outside of using or recovering from alcohol or drugs. So, um, Again, this gets back to point one. I mean, you really can't fully assess an anxiety disorder while somebody is either currently using or withdrawing. Um, so that you know, this the, the common theme I think throughout this talk is there's just not a, not enough investigation here, and this absolutely applies to this category. So there's been really few uh, trials that have examined pharmacologic treatment for anxiety in the context of substance use. My, my take on points here, um, if there's no bipolar disorder, then following the standard first-line treatments makes sense, so an SSRI or an SNRI. Although I will say there's been, there's been no, absolutely no clinical trials of these medications for anxiety in, in this population, so no data at all. Um, I put here that benzodiazepines are controversial. I, in honesty, I mean, I, I personally would not use a benzodiazepine in somebody who has a, a fairly strong history of substance use, but there, there is actually debate about this in the community. Um, there are those who feel like, you know, this, this treatment shouldn't be just automatically um, checked off and, and taken off the list for these folks, but I, I think the dangers far outweigh the benefits here. Um, there is limited support for buspirone and alcohol dependence with, with generalized anxiety and very limited, so one, one case report of gabapentin in, in, in social anxiety. Um, despite there being one case report, gabapentin gets used an awful lot in the substance abuse community. Um, again, you know, I think part of this is the, what, are, what are the other options? I mean, what to, you know, give me some other medications that we can use that, that aren't a benzodiazepine, especially for somebody who's been through a variety of uh, serotonergic antidepressants. What, what do we give people? It's not a good answer. The best answer is the next point, um, which is CBT. <laughs> so again, you know, think about psychotherapeutic options with these folks. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it was 18. 18%? Yeah, nearly 18%. Yeah, yeah. So that last bit here is, is just in talking about when medications don't work. Um, and again, I, I direct you back to Peter Roy Burns' paper on this. It's a really, really excellent review. But this, so that we, we, have, we run into this situation all the time. Um, what to do? So his first point is, rethink things, reevaluate things. Um, is there an alternative diagnosis that may be more appropriate here? I mean, is, is there something else that you're treating that's not a primary anxiety disorder? Um, as, as I've talked about throughout this talk, there are various other conditions that present with prominent anxiety symptoms. Depression is certainly one of those, although I will say, I mean, that's not going to change your treatment approach all that much. You're still going to be using an SSRI or an SNRI, so you're probably not going to learn all that much from learning, um, from realizing that your primary di diagnosis might be depression, not a primary anxiety disorder. Where you will potentially change your treatment is if you realize, does this person have some features that might suggest more of an atypical type 2 bipolar disorder or something like that, where Rather than an antidepressant treatment, you may really be better off thinking about a mood stabilizing treatment. Um, a realization that there may be an unrecognized substance use disorder. So, for example, somebody who is a social drinker who you may not realize is drinking maybe more than you thought they were drinking, and this uh, situation of going back and forth from uh, drinking and not drinking, whether it's uh, alcohol, whether it's you know cannabis as well, these things can precipitate anxiety symptoms, um, and, and maybe that's something that should be more of a focus in the treatment than it is. Um, ADHD as well, I'm not, I didn't really talk too much about ADHD today, but that's certainly another diagnosis where you find people with prominent anxiety, 
uh, and the treatments may be very different um, to manage that. So from that, uh, the question is, you know, am I using the correct treatment? Is the dose therapeutic? Is the duration sufficient? Um, usually for anxiety disorders, you know, we typically think of uh, necessary duration of treatment as being similar to depression where we're treating for, for four to six weeks with an SSRI. There's some evidence that, you know, even going beyond that might be necessary for some people. So maybe eight to 12 weeks might be worth it for some. And the, the bigger question, another question which um, I think was interesting that was raised in this paper is treatment adherence. Um, typically, folks with anxiety do tend to be a population that's psychosomatically focused, that can be particularly sensitive to the physiologic effects of medications. And so you may get people who uh, you know, aren't necessarily as compliant as you think they are. So assessing for this is actually an important thing. And then, like I've talked about, factors that may facilitate our anxiety or worsen course. Caffeine, over-the-counter meds, sleep deprivation, not something we necessarily think about all the time. And then obviously just things that are going on in their lives, which um, could impact how they're doing. And I'm gonna end on this because again, I think it's the biggest take-home point that's not a med has nothing to do with medication at all. Uh, what to do when medications don't work. So psychotherapeutic options. Um, CBT is obviously the thing that's been studied the most here. Um, I will say, I see some of my OCDI colleagues here, um, we get plenty of people who come into our program with generalized anxiety, social anxiety, panic disorder. Um, Exposure-based behavioral therapy really works for these folks as well. Um, um, DBT, um, particularly with, obviously with those who have um, anxiety in the context of personality disorders, but again, I mean, we, we, we don't use DBT per se in our program, but we certainly use um, approaches that are part of the DBT package, um, particularly mindfulness-based um, stress reduction, which I talk about next. Um, these things also really work for people. Um, and then last, um, exercise and yoga, which Again, I don't think it's something we really think about here, but um, for all of us have had, probably had the experience of, you know, being in a stressful situation, going for a brisk walk or a run or doing some, heading to the gym or whatever. These things really help. I mean, and, and getting a prescription pad out and putting, you know, take a walk every day, not necessarily a bad idea for some people. So um, I'm gonna end here, We've got a few good, 10 minutes or so for, for questions, but I really want to open it up. You know, if, if there are things that people want to talk about as a forum, I think it's a good place to do it. Yeah. Hey, Le Leslie, can you wait for the mic? <laughs> Sorry. I'm just looking at cannabis as a treatment as opposed to a uh, dr uh, drug. Uh, I've, got a ton of, I've, I've got a ton of adolescents that are self-medicating using, can using cannabis. What about that as a treatment as opposed to a drug problem? Yeah, that's not an easy one to answer, I think, at this point. Um, <clears throat> so I will say, wearing my uh, scientist hat here, that there's clearly evidence that um, cannabis works on there are very specific receptors in the brain, cannabinoid receptors, that play a role in anxiety. So from a scientific perspective, there, there certainly may be support for that. Um, I think there's a danger here, though. Um, because there, there are certainly downsides, um, particularly in those people who just have a predilection to abuse these things. And I think there's going to need to be a lot of research in that area to really tease that out. It's the short answer. So I think this is the, one of the hardest talks to give because anxiety <laughs> is so ubiquitous. And, and every axis one, just about, and every axis two can have it either as a comorbid second diagnosis or part and parcel of the major diagnosis. Absolutely. And then you're filled with um, chickens and eggs and rocks and hard places. <laughs> so the reason for my comment is that you can come out of a talk like this thinking that there were do's and don'ts or absolute no-nos, or, and I think there's a risk in that. Correct. I think yep. that the principles, you know, the better your diagnosis, the better your treatment is one, and the other is um, uh, risks and benefits and, and, and upfront discussion with the patient um, rather than we should really avoid benzos or we should really avoid atypicals. Uh, 
I mean, most of our patients that get admitted to the hospital, right, are given uh, anxiety, <laughs> are admitted with a PRN order of anxiety medicine and an atypical. And some for good reason and some for not so good reason, but the diagnosis obviously is imperfect. So I'm just saying that I think an, an approach that's a little bit more than the, you know, avoid or the third, you know, um, choice, although it's good to have those guideposts, it's also good to have a better diagnosis and better informed discussion with the patient. I, I completely agree. I, I've, I've I purposely taken the hard line approach here, um, and I'm glad you're coming at it from from the other end because I, I, I mean, especially working at a place like this, where oftentimes we're seeing people who there 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 is necessity to to reduce symptoms and get people better. Um, yes, agreed. Based on uh, the current research, what? are the cause or causes of anxiety disorders? Um, Easy question. Yes, right, right. Well, I will say, so we're far from understanding that question in a, in a very specific way. I will say that, that the brain circuitry involved in these disorders is fairly well understood. So the, the, the circuitry in the brain that's involved with fear um, is very is very well understood, and there's clearly uh, abnormalities in that circuit, hyperactivity primarily in that circuit, and people who have anxiety disorders. What brings that about? We don't necessarily know. Um, there's certainly probably a subset of patients who have um, early life stressors that may contribute to that, but that's certainly not everyone. Um, and so we, we have some understanding of the circuitry. We have some understanding, perhaps, of some of the neurochemistry. Uh, but it's, it's certainly an area that we, there's much more that we don't understand than we do at this point. Uh, and so, you know, it, there's, there's a reason why um, all of the treatments, uh, a lot of the treatments that I've listed up here are things that were developed for other disorders, for depression, for psychosis. Um, there are, other than buspar, uh, buspirone, there, there's virtually no treatment that I can think of that were actually developed primarily as an anxiety treatment. Uh, partly because we just really don't understand the pathophysiology of the disease very well. You said that 40 to 60 percent of patients don't respond to the first line treatment SSRI, SNI. When you come with your second order on third order drugs, how many percent is a, a respond or what is the non responder rate after all options? Not known. So again, we, we would need to do a star D like study to, to, to know to be able to answer would, that question. Would you say that despite the problems, benzodiazepines sort of work in most patients that you try them? Oh, they, they absolutely work. I mean, they're one of the most effective things we have. But the caveat to that is that they're, they might reduce anxiety, but they're not going to reduce the core symptoms of anxiety. They're, they're not going to make people less worried about what, what it is that's causing the anxiety. They might make them feel better for a period of eight or 10 or 12 hours, but once that's gone, it's just things come back, right? So. Yeah. Um, could you just comment a little more about this comorbidity of depression and anxiety? It seems to me uh, depression w in includes anxiety so predominantly yeah. That is the real evidence that th these are two separate disorders, or is it more? Th could it be the more that they're in the physiology of it all? They're just a lot of overlapping, and we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, no, I think you're onto something there. Um, I mean, we certainly categorize these things differently in DSM. How biologically different they are, I think, is still up for debate. I know I've, I've had my own debates with my colleagues, so, so I, whenever I talk to Jim Hudson or Skip Pope in, in our group about this very question, they say, well, they're, they're the same thing. You know, <laughs> they come from that school, but you know, um, there's, there's not enough evidence to de definitively say that, although oftentimes many of the treatments that we use, particularly, I mean, certainly in the medication arena, are very similar things. Yeah. Um, it seems like there's a really big disconnect between kind of like research hospital view of pr prescribing long-term benzos and, and kind of a more like 
private practice psychiatry offices. Do you do you have any like explanation for the reason behind that? It just seems like the word isn't really getting out that that's not the best treatment and how that can be remedied. So you mean that, that you think it's more prevalent out there in the community? Um, so I, I think that may partly be um, an education thing, but I, I think it may be honestly more the fact that as a community clinician out there, you know, you sometimes feel like you're a little bit out on an island um, and you've got a, you know, you've got somebody who may be doing miserably and you need to do whatever you can possibly do to get them better. Uh, you know, we, we have that stress to some degree here in the hospital, but um, it's not, it's sometimes not, not to the degree that somebody out in the community might have and feel like they just need to pull out whatever they can pull out to get people better. I mean, I, I suspect that's part of the reason why atypicals are also getting used a lot more in the community as well. Thank you for helping us think through this. Hopefully helping. Um, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It's a, uh, one of the, it's a, a variation on the similar theme with mood and depression and we, we use anxiety in such a broad way that it's very hard to even separate what it is that we're studying. But that's, we need to do what we can. So um, I understand the, the emphasis on, on, on the talking therapies, but my experience with a lot of folks who are feeling, especially in the acute state of these sorts of things, that it's very hard for them to focus on, on that. Yes. And, 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 the, and the pressure on the clinician is very much to provide a, 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 a more rapid response, right. which is, uh, I think, understandably what state they're in. So that's just more of a comment, that, that, that we can emphasize the CBT and the rest, and we often do that, but it's almost like yes, 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 but is, is, right. is the experience of working with folks. The other is more about the beta blockers, um, and that we mentioned that some folks tend to have a fair amount of somatization and physical right. experience of these things. My experience is that beta blockers are potentially helpful in that in that in that in that subgroup. So I just wondered if you have anything to say. About yeah, that. I mean, you know, again, it gets back to Steve's comment about risk benefit here. I mean. There's little downside to those um, other than making sure people aren't passing out. Um, and there, there can be upsides, certainly for people who have more of a, like, as you say, more of a psychosomatic focus, which really does happen a lot in these populations of people. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think if there's, if there's benefit, um, there's, there's, there's a, there may be a, a, a niche there for certain people who really have more prominent sort of somatic anxiety symptoms. Uh, a couple of quite different questions. Um, w one is that you appear to value pregabalin above benzodiazepines, um, and I think of their habituation potentials as somewhat similar, so I'm trying to figure out how to line up the two a little bit better. Um, the other thing is um, I see Buspar and high-dose propranolol as having quite good anti-severe agitation aggression um, potential. And does that fit on the anxiety spectrum, or is that a separate phenomenon? Yeah, so I mean, I think as, as, as I mentioned, well, so, so first with the, with the pregabalin comment, um, so I, I will admit I don't have a whole lot of experience prescribing pregabalin, um, <laughs> amazingly, um, given how much I am pushing in this topic. That's ba based solely on the evidence that's out there. Um, in, in preparation for a question like that, um, I did go back and, and look a little bit because you know there's there's some debate in the field actually about abuse liability with pregabalin. Um, there, and, I mean, the animal studies with with pregabalin suggested that it did not have much of an abuse liability, but there's certainly case a, a smattering of case reports out there of people overusing it or abusing it, and it you know it really it gets described as something that can have a bit of a euphoric effect when people take it. So. I think you know there's there's not a definitive um, ev there's no definitive evidence that it's 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 benzodiazepine like in that way, but I think it is something that actually probably needs to be watched out, you know, monitored, and, and um, done with caution, especially in those folks who you know. So in that population, you know, that has a substance use history where you clearly don't want to use a benzo, and you say, well, let me try pregabalin. Well, caution there. Uh, because of the, there there may be an issue, I think. Um, I mean, your comments with um, buspirone and, and beta blockers and agitation. I, mean, I 
again, you know, um, I think there are there are niches here for these medications where you might find them more useful. I think for the for the broad spectrum sort of you know, use in all situations where people have anxiety, um, they probably aren't good things, but there, I think there are instances where they could be very helpful, is, is take home. And you know, there, there's no evidence, there's no studies, there's nothing like that that's actually looked at that. I think this is ba purely based on anecdotal evidence and clinical experience. Great, so I think with that, we'll go ahead and conclude.